What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? All right. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, as I was telling Admiral McRaven, we have uh, hundreds of people from all over the world, random time zones, people waking up in the middle of the night uh, because we have such a distinguished guest. And I, the one, the, the really cool aspect of this is the ability in the midst of some tough things we're going through to create connection and community. And that's one of my favorite aspects about doing what I do is, is having the platform and the opportunity to do that. So one, thank you all for being here. Our guest today, Admiral William McRaven, retired U.S. Navy four-star admiral, uh, commander, U.S. Special Operations Command, led almost 70,000 men and women responsible for conducting counterterrorism operations worldwide. He oversaw the 2000, 2011 Navy SEAL raid in Pakistan that killed Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden, an incredible communicator, writer, speaker. Uh, I encourage you to read his books. Uh, if you haven't already, watch the commencement speech at Texas. It's incredible. We're going to cover some of those topics, but uh, please, let's uh, give a warm kind of virtual welcome to Admiral William McRaven. Thanks for being here, Admiral. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Great to be with you. <clears throat> I know you probably heard that read a lot, but it's still pretty remarkable to hear the accomplishments in your career. And one of the things I want that you've written about is the importance of surrounding yourself with exceptional people. Uh, Jim Collins might call that your who. And for me, I'm curious, Admiral, from your perspective, given the remarkable people that you've had the good fortune to work with, what have you found to be some of the commonalities among leaders and behaviors and traits who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time? Yeah, you know, I, I think that the best leaders you find are the ones that listen. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do as a leader. You know, you come in, you have this, uh, a, a little bit of this ego that, you know, you're the leader because obviously you must be the smartest man or woman in the room. Uh, that's why they made you the leader. And uh, if you're uh, really smart, you realize that no, that's not necessarily why they made you the leader. They made you the leader because you were able to galvanize the team that works with you and get them to, to conduct a mission and do it successfully. And you do that by listening to the men and women that work for you. Uh, because most of them have got you know, a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge. Now, at some point in time, of course, you've got to take the information they provide you and make a decision. Uh, so I would offer that listening is probably the, uh, you know, the best trait a leader can have. But then you know, the next thing is you, you've got to be able to act decisively. Once you have that information, you've got to be able to make a decision. And you won't always make the right decision, but I, I've found that uh, you know, the troops, whether they are your employees at the University of Texas system or the troops that work for me in special operations, um, they want you to make a thoughtful uh, decision, not waffle too long, and then you know, move out. Uh, and then be calm as you, you know, execute whatever mission you're, uh, you're in the midst of. I heard an interview with you at one point when I was prepping for this, and you've worked for multiple presidents, both Republicans and Democrats, so there's, there's no uh, political aspect to this question, but you mentioned that a common trait shared by both George W. Bush and Barack Obama was that, was their ability to listen to experts in the room. I'm curious, you've been in those rooms with the most powerful person in the world. Can you share what it's like being inside the room with both of those guys uh, and their ability to listen, lean on experts, and then make decisive decisions. Yeah, well, I think you summed it up nicely uh, right there. Uh, interestingly enough, while uh, you know President Obama and President Bush have different kind of external personalities, when they came into the Situation Room, which is where the you know the big uh, national security decisions are, are made, um, in both cases with President Bush and President Obama you would find as they sat at the head of the table and they would go around the room and talk to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Director of National Intelligence, um, that they were great at listening. They were great at taking the advice. And then once they had all the input, then unfortunately, you know, this is the, or fortunately or unfortunately, this is the role of the President. You've got to take all that input and you have to make the final decision. Uh, so in both cases, 
even though, uh, again, both men are, are, uh, are different in their kind of outward personalities, I found that inwardly the way that they collected information, assessed the information, and then made decisions was actually very similar. I want to, Admiral, I want to go a little bit earlier in your, uh, your life. Um, actually, I find it fascinating to hear about the upbringing of exceptional leaders like yourself. Specifically, you've described your dad as being an incredibly humble person, yet he's larger than life and a wonderful father uh, that you said. And, right. and there are a lot of people watching now listening that um, are parents and they're thinking, I want to be known, known as a wonderful mother or father. And they're curious about the actions, behaviors of your parents and how their, their child uh, grew up to be you. And I'm curious, what, what were some of the greatest learnings from your parents? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take it one step a little bit further. When I had my children, my first uh, son, uh, my mother gave me probably the best advice she could give me. Uh, when I asked her, you know, how do you raise, uh, you know, a young boy in this case? And she said, look, all you have to do is love them. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of encapsulated it all. You know, all you have to do is love them. Um, and if you love them, they will know that. And so when times get tough and they have to, you know, punish you for something you did poorly, or they have to critique you, or they have whatever it is, as long as you know that they love you, and that, uh, you know, what they're doing is in your best interests, then frankly, it's easier to accept that criticism, it's easier to accept that inspiration, it's just easier to be a child. So I think when I grew up, I never doubted for a second that my parents loved me. And that's not to say again, that, you know, when I, <laughs> when I messed up, which I did routinely as a young boy, um, you know, my parents didn't hold me accountable. Uh, and that, that was not always, uh, always fun, but it was, I think, always necessary to make me understand uh, that, you know, you, you, you do things and there is a, there's an accountability to be had if you do them poorly or wrong. Um, but I never doubted that they loved me. So that, that really, I think, is probably the key to raising successful children. In addition to that, um, I think this relates to people in general, but you've also had the good fortune of being surrounded by great coaches. And I am a firm believer that everybody needs a coach, uh, regardless of your age, regardless of your experience, regardless of what you do. I, I, my background's in athletics. I know your background's also in athletics uh, prior to your military career. And the, 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 other than my direct family, my immediate family, the people who have impacted me the most were my coaches. And so I, I, I've learned the value of them. And you had one earlier in your life, um, specifically, who was really good about pushing you. I believe his name is Jerry Turnbow, when it comes right. to, came to running the mile. And can you share more about the importance of why he was so impactful for you and then more zoomed out the importance of coaching for all of us? Yes. The, the fact of the matter is, I think, you know, Ryan, that, uh, you know, aside from your parents or your guardians or, uh, you know, whoever your closest relative might be, your teachers and your coaches probably have the most impact on you as a young man or woman. Uh, and coaches I would offer, uh, at least for me, because, you know, you, when I was a young boy, I had this aspiration, you know, I wanted to be a, a gold medal winner at the Olympics, even though I had absolutely no talent to do that. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you motivate yourself by, by setting this incredibly high goal and, and you have to inspire yourself that this is, this is what you're going to do. You're going to achieve this lofty goal of being a gold medal uh, winner. Uh, and, of course, I was a, a miler. There's not even a mile in the, in the Olympics, but that's, that's an aside. Uh, so uh, my senior year, uh, I was trying to break the school record in the mile. And uh, the second to the last race, uh, I'd had an abysmal race. The, the school record in the mile had been four minutes and 32 seconds. Um, and I'd run a 437, which is, you know, five seconds off. That's an eternity in the mile. And, uh, and so I, just a, a horrible race. And I thought, well, I, I'm never going to make this. Well, one more week uh, I had before my final race. And the night before my final race, uh, I, received, I was at home and I received this phone call. And uh, my dad said, hey, your, your coach is on the line. 
And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I mean, I just left track practice. Coach didn't tell me anything. Well, I picked up the phone, and it wasn't my track coach. It was the assistant football coach, uh, Jerry Turnbow. And, and I, I, I knew Jerry Turnbow because, again, as a young kid, certainly in the state of Texas, you know, football is king. And when you're the, uh, one of the head football coaches, you know, you're viewed as this kind of, you know, semi-god up there uh, on Mount Olympus. And I thought, oh, my gosh, it's Coach Turnbow. And he called me and he said, hey, Bill, I understand, uh, you know, you've got your, your last uh, mile run tomorrow. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, so you're trying to break the school record? I said, yeah. He said, well, Bill, you can do this. You just run hard. You just run hard and you can break the record. And I remember I was so, uh, you know, I was so inspired by the fact that this coach would take, you know, a moment out of his time to call me from his home to my home. Uh, and I didn't even think he knew who I was. Well, the next day I went out and, and I broke the record. And, and what, I, uh, what I tell folks is, you know, one, it's a record that nobody cared about but me. Uh, in fact, the next year it was broken by a faster runner than I was. But what it did was it convinced me that if I set a goal, the goal of, in this case, breaking the mile record, and I worked hard and I got a little inspiration, I could do anything. And, of course, so at the time I thought, well, I'm going to go be a Navy SEAL. Had I not broken that record, I'm not sure I would have felt that was within my grasp. And so I look at those events, and we all have those events in life that, you know, suddenly – a phone call, a pat on the back, uh, you know, you get a good grade on a test you worked hard on and it inspires you, encourages you to do something else and it potentially changes the entire trajectory of your life. Well, I think that's kind of what uh, the phone call from Coach Turnbow did. Uh, it, it changed the entire trajectory of my life because I convinced myself that I could go off and be a Navy SEAL and, and I did and, and that changed everything for me. I feel like the lesson there for all of us who play a leadership role for people in our lives is when in doubt, make the call, make yeah. a, make a call, uh, send the note, send the text, whatever to, to whoever it is. May, send it. I, last night, my wife Miranda reminded me, uh, she's like, you should reconnect with coach George Raveling and coach Raveling is one of like one of my greatest mentors of all time. He's incredible. And I sent him this pretty, I think, heartfelt note to tell him I was thinking about him. And he, he immediately wrote me back and just said, like, this, this made my day. And I thought, what, what, a, what a lesson for all of us right now, at Admiral, is, is make the call. You know, when we have these times, and, and I'm curious from your perspective as the leader for others who look up to you, how do you work to implement that as the person who could be helpful for others and inspire them to break the record, become a Navy SEAL, lead the Bin Laden raid, whatever it may be. I'm curious. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the lesson of, of Coach Turnbow was kind of reinforced several years later. Um, my next door neighbor growing up in San Antonio, uh, he was an Air Force officer. He was several years older than I was, probably 10, 12 years older than I was. And, uh, and I was a young, I think, lieutenant junior grade or maybe Navy lieutenant. And he had bumped into somebody and, uh, and, and saw me and heard that I was doing a good job. And he called or he wrote, I forget, I think he wrote my parents a letter. He wrote my parents a letter and, and said, uh, hey, uh, I just want you to know I heard Bill's doing a great job and, you know, and said a lot of good things. And, of course, to my parents, I mean, that was, you know, that, that was the most important thing they could have received. And his writing the letter to his parents became something I did over the years. I realized that if I wrote a letter to one of my soldiers or sailors and said, hey, you're doing a great job, yes, they appreciated that. But let me tell you, you write it to their parents or their guardian or their wife or whoever, their wife or their husband, and you say, let me tell you, you know, this person is exceptional. That means more to them than a letter to themselves. And, and so back to the issue of inspiration. Yeah, I, I tell folks, like, yeah, most people are never going to have a chance to, you know, lead the raid to get bin Laden or rescue a Captain Phillips or capture a Saddam Hussein. But we will all have the opportunity to inspire some young man or woman at some point in time in our life. And we should never, ever pass up that moment. Well, a good lesson I've learned earlier is love the people who love the person that you're trying to lift up. Show love right. on them. And so that right. that that kind of exercise of writing a note to the spouse or to the parents or even to the kids. I mean, right. I'm a parent, you're a parent. 
what's better than having your kids think you're cool, even for just yeah. five minutes? You know, it's very rare in my life, but even for just five minutes, if they think I'm cool, like it really means a lot to me. Uh, you know? Exactly right. <laughs> I want to go, you mentioned uh, becoming a Navy SEAL and the training. And part of the training is the fact that you're going to experience failure. And that's just a part of becoming a SEAL. I'm not one and never been through any of that, but I read a ton about it. My, like again, my, my, my background's in sports and we had some military uh, coaches, people with military backgrounds. So they put us through probably many versions of things you've gone through. But, but there is a thing called being assigned to the circus. And you've spoken about this, you've written about this. And I think maybe we can share broader what you learned from being in the circus and how that could apply to other people's lives as they hit points of failure and how to bounce back from it. Yeah, so the, the circus and SEAL training, uh, you know, everything was measured. Uh, you know, your run times were measured, your uh, swims were measured, your tests you took, they were all, everything had a standard you had to meet. And if you failed to meet the run time uh, in the course of the day or the swim time, then at the end of the day, so after a full day of constantly, you know, being harassed by the instructors and, and being cold, wet, and miserable and doing hours of calisthenics, at the end of the day, you got another two hours of calisthenics. And so this was the circus. And for a lot of people, the circus was a bit of a death spiral. So if you went into the circus and you were tired on a Monday, then, you know, you were probably going to make the circus again on Tuesday. And then if you made the circus on Tuesday, you were going to be tired again come Wednesday and you were going to fail again. And so a lot of folks, when they got on the circus list on a Monday, they just quit because they thought they weren't going to have the ability to make it through the week uh, in the circus. Well, I, I <laughs> unfortunately, I made the circus uh, quite a bit in my time. And, uh, and what you find with the circus, one, it is a recognition that you failed. So mentally, you have to be able to deal with the fact that, okay, uh, I failed an event, uh, but now I'm going to be held accountable for that failure, which means I've got another two hours of calisthenics. They're going to try to break me in this case. Uh, can you withstand the failure? Uh, and then the next morning, you wake up and you're tired. But what you find, I think, in dealing with the failure of the circus or any other failure is, you know, sometimes just plain hard work will get you past the rough spot. Uh, know that it's going to be challenging. You know, know that it will not be easy. But also recognize that, you know, all of us can overcome the failure. Uh, but a lot of it is, you know, put your head down, work hard, work through it, recognize where you made the mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and move on. Um, and then try not to look back on the failures too often. The, and not to harp too much on this, but just one more thing, because I think it, it, it shows – there are people who are facing tough times. They're either got laid off, they're laying people off, they're, they're, they're going through some, a tough stretch right now. And in July 1983, you were fired. You were or relieved of your SEAL squadron, which is, which is not good uh, at yeah. the SEAL. And, and part, of it, part of the reason was you were trying to change the way the squadron was organized, trained, and conducted missions. And I'm curious, so, so, so how did, you, how did that, that firing alter your trajectory and how did you respond from it? Yeah, so I, to your point, Ryan, I mean, it's never good to get uh, fired. It's really bad to get fired in the Navy. And it's particularly bad to get fired in the SEAL teams because you're, it's such a small unit. Everybody knows you have been fired. So, you know, you have a, a big brand on you and, uh, and everybody you meet, you know, sometimes they'll come up to you and they'll pat you on the back and they'll say, hey, Bill, good to see you. How you doing? You know, how things going? But you realize and you know what they're thinking, which is, hey, you were fired. Are you good enough to be one of my officers? Are you good enough to lead me in combat? Should you still be here? So you have to deal with the self-doubt. But for me, um, I, I was married, had two kids at the time. Uh, and I remember going home thinking, wow, I don't know if I have a career left. Um, so I, I went home to my wife the day I was fired. And, uh, and frankly, had it not been for her, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Because I, I said, look, I, like I said, I, I'm not sure I've got a career left. Uh, you know, it's not good to get fired. And she said, look, you've never quit at anything in your life. Don't start now. And, and that ability to have someone. And, you know, we all need a, a swim buddy. We all need somebody to kind of pick us up off the ground, dust us off, and say, look, it's going to be okay. Uh, you know, double down, work hard, uh, and you'll overcome this. So, so one, you have, to, you have to be able to deal with the failure, 
uh, you have to figure out again what the uh, you know what you did wrong, but you don't quit. I mean, that's that's the last thing that you want to do. Now, the, the people that are having to deal with this today, I mean, these are tough, tough circumstances, and and my my heart goes out to all these folks that are unemployed because sometimes you just can't work through it. I mean, this is this is not a time they can double down and work hard because there's no work to be had. Um, but I would tell them to just kind of keep the faith. Uh, you know, know that uh, that there are a lot of people that are prepared to pick them up and dust them off and tell them it's going to be okay. We'll get through this. Uh, and I'm confident that we will. So um, you've written that you've always had great respect for the British Special Air Service, uh, the, the famed SAS. Right. And their, their motto was, who dares wins. And, uh, and so I want to get to the Bin Laden raid. Um, and you said this is even a, a quote or a motto that was repeated uh, as you guys were going in for this raid by Sergeant Major, Major Chris Ferris, I believe his name is, quoted that to the SEALs preparing for the mission. And so that, that was kind of the motto for you as for how special forces operated. And it's how each of us should approach our lives. And so first, I'd love to, 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 if you, being the person who spearheaded this mission um, to go get the most wanted person on the planet, um, there's a lot to get to here, but first and foremost, I'd love to, 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 if you could take us share at least what you're allowed from a strategy perspective. I know there was a lot of collaboration with the CIA and Leon Panetta, and I, I, you've, you've spoken very highly of him and, and, and how his involvement, as well as the guts it took to make the decision. Can, can you take us inside what was going through your mind as you're building the strategy, as you're working with the CIA and the president and, and everybody involved? Um, and then maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into the actual night. Yeah, so, you know, I became aware of this in December of 2010 when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, came out to Afghanistan and, uh, and told me that the CIA may be contacting me. Uh, they had a lead on bin Laden, and they might ask me to come back to Langley and, and talk to him about it. Candidly, uh, I was probably a little dismissive because we'd had a lot of leads on bin Laden, um, but... Obviously, I said, yes, sir. Uh, if I get a call, I'm happy to go back. Well, about three weeks later, I got a call to come back to Langley, and I sat down with the deputy director, uh, Michael Morell, and we went over the, uh, the compound uh, that was there in Abbottabad. Um, and, you know, it was a, you know, he said, you know, how would you do this? I said, look, this is, this is what we do. You know, we were doing about 20 to 25 missions a night in Iraq. We were doing about 10 to 12 missions a night in Afghanistan. You know, the average mission, you'd get you know, 50 or 60 operators, uh, Rangers, SEALs, uh, Army Special Forces, put them on a bunch of helicopters, fly them from a forward operating base, land about 10 kilometers from a target, patrol to the target, surround the target. Uh, Rangers will put up blocking forces so the target couldn't be reinforced. Snipers get up on the wall, you get the target sealed off, and then you ask the, the bad guy to come out. Believe it or not, we actually did that. Call a call out. You get on a bullhorn and say, come out with your hands up. Uh, it didn't always work. I was going to say, does that work? Sometimes it did. They just um, come out and that's that? Well, when, when they know they're surrounded and there's no place to go, yeah, sometimes they, uh, they think through this, but not always. <laughs> okay. uh, and then, you know, things would get sporty. We'd get the guy, put him back on a helicopter and, and come back home. So, uh, you know, we were used to doing that. So when I looked at the compound, I said, hey, it's compound. It's bigger than the ones we're used to, but, you know, basically the same approach. Um, but, but as time went on, uh, I, I started coming back uh, from, Iraq, from Afghanistan to Langley to, to build the plan. And over the course of the next, uh, you know, January, February, March, April, the you know, next four months, uh, I was in probably six or seven meetings with the president. And every time we were in one of the meetings, the president would ask uh, Leon Panetta, the director of the CIA, well, do you think it's Bin Laden? And while, while De Director Panetta was confident that it was, uh, there were a lot of people in the CIA that weren't so sure. Uh, and so you had this really kind of a mixed bag of, yeah, we think it's him, but we're not certain. And this will go down as one of the great intelligence operations in the history of the CIA, and rightfully so. But it was just hard, even with the technical intelligence and the overhead intelligence and the human intelligence, to determine whether or not the man that was walking around the inside of the compound, who we referred to as the pacer, whether that was truly Bin Laden. And so this became, I think, one of the reasons that I've said that I thought it was one of the great decisions uh, uh, in, in modern history was because the president, President Obama, we just didn't know. 
And so on the last meeting I had with the president, which was uh, uh, the Wednesday, so late April, maybe April 30th or something like that, um, you know, the president had asked uh, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, Mike Leiter, to review CIA's intelligence and give him an assessment of whether or not, you know, uh, what, whether the National Counterterrorism Center thought it was, uh, it was bin Laden. And as the meeting started, uh, he turned to Leiter and Leiter said, well, Mr. President, we've reviewed CIA's intelligence and we think the chance that it's bin Laden is anywhere between 60% and 40%. Now, when he said 40%, I'm thinking, well, this mission's off. I mean, who in the world would authorize a bunch of SEALs to fly 162 miles, you know, into Pakistan uh, where they have a, an integrated air defense? This compound was about three or four miles from their West Point. It was about three or four miles from a major infantry battalion. It was a mile from a, um, from a police station. Oh, by the way, the Pakistanis have nuclear weapons. I mean, who would make that call? But I told the president, I said, sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head to Afghanistan. Uh, you know, I'll make sure the boys are ready to go. Uh, if you decide to go, then uh, we'll go do the mission. If you decide not to, no problem. I got bad guys in Afghanistan. We'll just get back to work. So I left uh, Wednesday evening, got there, and on, on Friday, Leon Panetta called and said, hey, the president's made the decision to go. And I've told folks, I said, look, irrespective of, you know, what side of the aisle you're on, uh, this was an incredibly bold decision on the part of the president. Uh, again, he must have known, although we never talked about it, uh, but he must have thought about Jimmy Carter and the decision, uh, you know, 40 years ago this week uh, to try to rescue the American hostages out of Iran. Uh, that did not go well for Carter, and he became a one-term president. If this didn't go well for Obama, he would be a one-term president. Uh, and again, while we never talked about that, I'm sure uh, that must have gone through his mind. Well, on Saturday, the president called me and, uh, and said, well, Bill, what do you think? And I said, well, Mr. President, I said, if he's there, we'll get him. If not, we'll come home. The problem with the come home scenario, which I had briefed him before, was if the SEALs land on target and a guy comes out with a gun, it's not going to go too well for that guy. And if somebody else comes out with a gun, they will go down as well. And as the SEALs start to sweep through the target from the first floor to the second floor to the third floor, you know, killing uh, guys on their way up to the third floor where we thought bin Laden was, and then we get up there and it turns out the guy we thought was bin Laden is nothing but a tall Pakistani, well, then this will be, you know, uh, a mistake of, of epic proportions. Now, I didn't tell the president that on the phone, but I know he understood that. Um, but again, he still made the decision to go. What was it like with the guys? Um, and and you know, we've seen the most of us probably seen the movies. If if there was a, a woman, or I heard it was a team of women who helped uh, identify him, and and you see the uh, the dramatic moment. I'm a, it's a hundred. It's a hundred. I'm sure he's there um, for, for, from from the Zero Dark Thirty movie. But what was it like? once the mission was over and the, and the team was back, um, were you, were you physically with them at that time? Was, was it celebratory? Was it business as, as usual? What was it like? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was with them at the time, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, the president had asked me, you know, w once we had gotten the, uh, the call from the ground force commander, uh, uh you know, Geronimo for God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo. Uh, and that was about 15 minutes or so into the mission. Uh, we were on the ground about 48 minutes. Took about an hour and a half or so to fly back. And then as they were on their way back, uh, the president asked me, uh, well, do you know for certain whether it's bin Laden? And I said, no, sir, I, I need to go visually ID the remains. And the airfield was just a, a minute or two from my little makeshift command center. So I drove over there right about the time the SEALs were landing. Uh, and... Yeah, they were they were happy. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it you know uh, overly celebratory, but you know they were back from a mission where I think every person that got on that helicopter realized that they could have been shot down, that this could have been a disaster if things had gone south. Uh, the the building could have been booby trapped. Bin Laden could have been booby trapped, and fortunately they all made it back alive. So yeah, you're you know you're going to be pretty damn happy about that. And of course uh, the fact that they got Bin Laden, uh, yeah. So it was. Um, it wasn't business as usual. They understood the nature of the mission and what they had just accomplished. Um, but we, you know, we brought the, uh, the remains back in. You know, I unzipped the body bag, took a look at the body. Uh, he obviously didn't look too good. He had a couple rounds in his head. 
uh, but pretty certain it was uh, it was Bin Laden. We took some um, you know some measurements and and made sure that uh, we got the information back to the agency. They did a you know facial recognition and a number of other things. We we also did forensics. We did a DNA swab on him and all those sorts of things. Um, for me, though, you know, it, it, uh, I, I was not necessarily in a celebratory mood. We still had to get Bin Laden's body uh, out to the Carl Vincent, which was uh, out in the Gulf. Uh, so we put the, the remains back on two Marine Corps uh, uh, CV-22s, and they flew back into Pakistan, actually, back down the air corridor, uh, back out to the, uh, uh, to the Carl Vincent. And, uh, but frankly, I also had uh, 10 other missions going on that night in, uh, in Afghanistan. Wow, so, really? Yeah. Uh, it, so, you know, you just, you, you realize that, uh, you know, we, we still had things to do. And, yeah, uh, so I, it didn't really hit me, candidly, uh, the magnitude of the mission until many, many months later um, when I was actually in New York City. And, uh, and that's when I think I really began to realize the, the impact of the mission on the American people. What do you draw from it now that you've, there's been plenty of time to reflect, to analyze, to be thoughtful about that night and the preparation and the decision making and the successful mission? What do you draw from that now as you look to other, other aspects of leadership in your life? You certainly had, had you, were, you remained a SEAL and a leader after that. You went on to work at, for the University of Texas as leading that organization. What do you draw from specific big inflection point moments like that that has helped you? Uh, and the reason I ask is I feel like th th this type of advice is what can help all of the people watching sure. and listening from around the world. Yeah, so let me start with the CIA and Leon Panetta. Um, so uh, Leon Panetta, one, one of the most gregarious guys you'll ever meet, uh, the consummate team player. So, you know, the CIA had all the intelligence, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was their intelligence. Uh, they had a force uh, that probably could have, you know, done this or done some aspect of this. Um, but Panetta very quickly realized that, look, it's not about the CIA. I knew right from the beginning, it wasn't about special operations. This was about doing what was right for the nation. And so Panetta, instead of making this an entirely CIA run operation, you know, calls in the military and says, look, I need the guys that, uh, that do this for a living. Um, so when, when you look at, um, you know, how great leaders work, great leaders recognize it's never about them. If it ever becomes about you, you're probably not a very good leader. The fact of the matter is, it's about accomplishing the mission. It's about bringing in whoever you need to help you accomplish the mission. It's about recognizing that, you know, you, your organization, uh, you know, your staff, there may be some shortfalls and how do you shore up those shortfalls in order to accomplish the mission? Um, so that, that would be part one. And uh, again, I, I look back and think that the whole success of this really rested on, uh, on two people, uh, Leon Panetta, who made the decision initially to bring us in. And then of course, the president of the United States. Um, and as I said, the president uh, would come into the situation room and he would listen to all aspects all concerns from all parties around. But at the end of the day, it was the president's decision uh, to conduct the mission. And so, as I said early on, you have to listen, but a great leader recognizes that sooner or later, the responsibility falls to them. And, uh, and it fell to the president of the United States. He made the hard decision, recognizing all the risks that went with that decision, the professional risks, the personal risks, and he made the decision anyway. And then finally, of course, it was you know, the, the magnificent uh, SEALs and, uh, and Task Force 160 Army aviators that conducted the mission. Uh, they were incredibly professional. Uh, they, they rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. They worked all the risk out of the mission. And then they had the, the courage uh, to get on those helicopters and, and go do the mission. Um, so when you look at uh, it, you know, what, what shows great leadership, it is this ability to be a team player and recognize it's not about you. It's about making the hard decisions when you need to. And then it's about being courageous and leading from the front, which is, again, what the great SEAL and, uh, and Army aviators did. And I, the, the part about rehearsing and practicing, we, we all have big moments, certainly most of us or none of us, uh, of what those guys did that night. But the, the, the fact that these, these 
professionals who had done this all the time, yet still rehearsed and rehearsed and practiced. And then a helicopter goes down and, right. and, you know, and they're all like, okay, you know, like business as usual, when a copter, go, uh, one went down and they, and they were able to not let it deter or change the mission. And they kept moving forward because they were so overly prepared. I think we can all draw from that because for whatever the big moments are in our lives, a big interview, a job that we're going for, or we have a town hall meeting that we're leading. How many times did you practice the speech? How many times have you practiced and prepared yourself to get ready? I think that's the key learning we can draw is that these guys are the best of the best who have been doing it for years, and yet they're still practicing over and over and over and are prepared for when things were to go wrong, like, like a helicopter going down. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it is about no matter how good you get, uh, if you ever get to the point where you think you can wing something, uh, again, you're probably not in the right position to be leading the mission. The fact of the matter is, you know, the enemy always gets a vote. You know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's what we say in the military, meaning that things are going to go wrong. You know, it's, it's Murphy's Law. So you better have plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D, which is what we did on the bin Laden raid. Uh, and then again, you rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You work as hard as you need to to take all the risk out of the mission. And the, and the mission can be, as you said, you're about to go do a town hall meeting. Uh, you're going to check the audio visual. You're going to make sure that when you get up there and if you're going to do a PowerPoint brief, that you have looked at that brief and that if that doesn't work, that you've got handouts you can provide to people. Whatever it happens to be, you better think through the worst case scenarios and have a plan to deal with them. Exactly. You're no, none of us are too big or too busy to not rehearse exactly. and practice. If, if you're a leader and you're running bad meetings, it's your fault. It's your fault. That's it, right. it, 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 it's on you then to, to, to make those better. Uh, so you, you've lived quite a life just within the military, uh, including spending 30 days with Saddam Hussein. And one, one of the parts that you've written about uh, when it comes to courage, and I think courage is such an awesome quality in leaders, but without courage, men will be ruled by tyrants and despots. Without courage, no great society can flourish. Without courage, the bullies of the world rise up. And you, you, I, I want you to tell the story about when you first would, went in to see Saddam Hussein uh, about the fact that he would rise to meet you and you would motion to him to say, sit down, right? Sit down. Uh, you're not important anymore. And I, I would love for you to share your mindset as you stood up to one of the ultimate bullies. Yeah, I don't know. It was so much me standing up to him. But the, but the fact of the matter is what was apparent to me when we uh, captured Saddam was that for the first couple of days, he was as arrogant and as pompous as ever. He was still, you know, the president of Iraq in his mind, and he treated people the way, you know, you would expect a tyrant to treat people around him. And, you know, but as the days went on and he no longer had his palaces and he no longer had his generals and he no longer had all the trappings of power, he really just became a pathetic old man. And I always tell people, contrast that with a Nelson Mandela who spent almost 30 years incarcerated. And because Mandela had this great strength of character, this great integrity, after 30 years, Mandela comes out as strong, maybe stronger than when he went in. Saddam Hussein, because he was an evil, corrupt person, you know, collapses in a couple of days and really just becomes pathetic. Um, but to your point about, uh, yeah, every day I would come in to check on him. And, and I always had a, uh, a, a medic or a doctor and a ranger security guard in the room with him. And it was just a, a small room, but I, you know, he was an old man and the last thing I wanted him to do was to die on my watch. Um, so, you know, we treated him very well. I mean, he got, you know, four meals a day and we gave him books to read. We treated him appropriately. Uh, but I told the guys, I said, do not engage in conversation with him. Uh, you know, I, I wanna make sure that he understands that, you know, he, he may not be in a cell and he may, uh, you know, this may be uh, better living than he would, uh, would have assumed, but we're not going to engage in conversation with him. Um, so uh, they would go in, they were kind of like four on, four off sort of thing. But every day I would come in to check on him. And every day, to your point, Ryan, he would rise and, and try to engage me in conversation. And I'd say, you know, with my hands, I'd go, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not talking to you, have a seat. And, uh, and, and part of this, of course, was to let him know that, 
he was no longer in charge. Um, and I, I that wasn't trying to stand up to the bully. It was just to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, he understood that, uh, you know, that he was no longer the president of Iraq and, and Iraq was going to move forward without him. Uh, fascinating story. Um, this may be a kind of a left turn, but I think it's important because I, 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 I mean, I personally value this. You're a journalism major in college and you're an excellent writer and storyteller. Uh, you've written multiple books. You've written one of the, written and delivered one of the greatest commencement speeches of all time. And I am a firm believer that excellent leaders must be great writers. And if you're not, it's a skill you should invest time uh, in yourself to become a better writer, a better communicator as a whole. And I think a, a, one, a great way to become a better speaker is to be a better writer. Can you share about your process and why you value the craft of writing and how that has made you a better communicator and leader? Well, fortunately, I was a journalism major in college. And uh, now I was a journalism major because I couldn't do math, I couldn't do science, I couldn't do accounting, and it turns out I could write a little bit. So, uh, so I, I transitioned over in my junior year to become a, a journalist. And, uh, and to your point, Ryan, you know, people used to always laugh and say, well, what good did that do you in the military? And the answer was, it was a fabulous skill to have. Because at the end of the day, a leader has to be able to convey his or her thoughts clearly, concisely, so that whatever the, whoever the audience is, the troops, the employees, uh, they understand your message. And so being able to write, uh, to being able to articulate complex ideas into something simple uh, so that it is easy to communicate is critical. Uh, in fact, I just had a young lady write me the other day. She's in my graduate school class, and she, uh, she said, hey, you know, love the class. What other classes can I take? And I told her, go to the School of Journalism, School of Communications at the university, and take a writing class. Learn to write. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, engineers tend to rule the world, particularly with the, uh, you know, the tech world being what it is. But at the end of the day, uh, I continue to think the, the pen is mightier than the electron and, uh, and people being able to write is still going to be a great skill to have. And again, I think also to speak in public as well. Speaking of that, what was the process like for you to prepare to deliver the commencement speech at Texas that is now viral, uh, which also the offshoot of that was your, your New York Times bestselling book titled Make Your Bed. Uh, encourage everyone to buy that and to read it. Um, it is a quick read, but it's very useful and practical. But I, I'm fascinated by the prep process yeah. and then how it was delivered. Because I would imagine, given a guy like you, uh, you probably read that thing like a thousand times before you actually delivered it. But I, but I, but take me inside. What was it like? The writing and then the, and then the, the the prep right before you delivered it. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit because oh, I would oh, no. tell you that normally. You are right. Normally, I, I write a speech, and you bet. I rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it, even if it's going to be right in front of me, because recognizing when you're going to emphasize things and when you're not. But in this case, what happened was I had been writing a speech. that The president of the University of Texas had called me, I don't know, six months ahead of time and said, would you like to be the commencement speaker? I said, of course. I'd be honored to do so. But I didn't really start writing the speech until about a month out. And I, would, I was had a day job, so... You know, I'd write a little bit here and write a little bit there. And as I was starting to complete the speech on the Wednesday of the, the week I was supposed to give it on a Saturday, on Wednesday, I started reading my speech and I realized it didn't work. Uh, I, you know, a good speech has got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's got to have a theme. It's got to all come together. And it didn't. And so now I'm, I'm in a bit of a panic mode going, oh, my gosh, I'm about to give this on Saturday. I don't have a good speech here. So I, I came down to my wife and, uh, and I said, she's always my first reader on things. And I said, this isn't any good. And she said, look, why don't you write about something you know? And I thought, well, there's a novel idea. Um, but uh, so I said, look, the only thing I know is being a Navy SEAL. She said, well, then write about being a Navy SEAL. And I said, look, I'm about to talk to you know, 30,000 people, 8,000 students and their parents and everything. I said, I don't know if they want to hear a speech. I mean, this is a university environment. I don't know if they want to hear a speech from a guy in uniform about being a Navy SEAL. 
but she convinced me that it was probably the right thing to do. So I started writing it, I think, Thursday. I didn't actually finish writing the speech until about an hour before I gave it. No way. Uh, in fact, yeah, the University of Texas called over to my, aide, my military aide to camp and said, hey, we need the Admiral's speech. And the aide said, he's still writing it. And, and the woman said, he's giving it in an hour. He said, yeah, yeah, I know. But uh, so uh, I, I finished it up, uh, you know, made sure I, I knew what it said. I rehearsed it as many times as I could before I hopped in the car to go over to the, to the university. But, uh, but it was written in a little bit. I mean, again, I, it, I, a couple of days, it doesn't take me long to write a speech. Um, but it was probably better that I didn't spend, you know, six months writing the thing. It worked out, worked out okay. Do you write it by yourself and then your wife oh, looks yeah. at it? That's it? Oh, yeah. And, and actually, rarely do I let my wife read my speeches. I did on this one because I was floundering with it. I actually, uh, that's probably about the only speech she's ever seen. She reads all the stuff that I write, like for Make Your Bed or for Sea Stories. She's my first reader on those. But on the speeches, it's just kind of one of these superstitions I have. Uh, it may not be a good one because, you know, the next speech you give could be horrible and, and she may have been able to walk me away from that minefield. I don't know. Wow. Well, it's well done. Um, I, I could talk about it. I do want to open it up, though, because we, we do have a few people who have uh, requested to, to speak directly with you, Admiral. And so I want to go first to, to Dave Matthews. Um, and I'm going to unmute you here, Dave. Okay, we got you going. And by the way, uh, I, I emailed with Dave. I'm a huge Dave Matthews fan, uh, a different Dave Matthews, and I found out that this Dave Matthews is as well. But he, uh, he wants to ask the first question. Put yourself on video so we can see you, Dave, and uh, fire away, man. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, definitely a big Dave Matthews fan. <laughs> Unfortunately, not the, not the famous one. Um, but, you know, Admiral, first and foremost, I have so much admiration and respect for anyone that has served our country especially someone that's made the profound impact through their service, such as yourself. So oh, thank nice you very much. Um, the company I work for, Insight Global, we hire entry level. We promote from within. So it's, it's super powerful for our company. Um, but we have to be very patient to allow for our people to fail, to learn, and to grow. Right. So every leader we have is literally, they're in their first leadership role. Um, I know earlier Ryan touched on just how what you learned as a youthful leader, but as you see things today, what would your advice be to a brand new leader, someone that has went from a producer to suddenly leading those producers? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, you know, one of the the best bits of advice I got as a young junior officer uh, was, you know, when you went into a new position find the chief petty officer, in other words, the senior enlisted guy there, find the chief petty officer and sit down with him and get their advice. It does a couple things. One, it, it immediately, you know, uh, gives that individual the sense that you're prepared to listen. And two, the advice they have is probably going to be pretty solid. So if you're coming into a situation as a, you know, uh, you're new in a leadership position, find out who's been there a while. You know, find out who the you know, the, b between, uh, you know, again, I'm not exactly sure what your organization would look like, but find out who that senior person is, the, the old hand there, sit down with them, listen to them, find out what they think a good leader should look like, how a good leader should act, and that'll give you some initial, uh, you know, uh, initial step on the ladder to start to move up. Uh, it's always good to listen, you know, listen to the people around you, you know, make a good decision. Uh, make sure you also have a sense of humor. I think sometimes that is, uh, that's lost, but, but all good leaders I've known have got a great sense of humor. They can, they can take self-criticism. Uh, they can kind of laugh about their own shortcomings. So, uh, yeah, these are, these are good steps, but, but listen first um, and then make the decisions you need to make. Great, great question, Dave. I remember, uh, I, th I believe he's on here. Uh, he's listening. I don't think he's watching though as um uh, Rex Caswell, my first ever uh, VP, he gave me advice when I was brand new. I'd finished playing football after college, and I had no idea what I was doing. And luckily, he took a chance on me, and I'll forever be grateful. And he said, uh, keep a notebook uh, and yeah. study the leaders within the business and write down 
I have two columns. On one column, write down all the things that, have, that, that were effective for you, that made you better. And then also write down on the right-hand column all the things that were not effective, that were not useful, that weren't good. And always hold on to that notebook and never forget what it's like to be the posi- in the position of an individual contributor and regularly update that. Now it's shifted to a Google Doc, but I think that's a good practice and just the, the act of, ha- of always documenting what excellent looks like in your mind, coupled with, I think, uh, uh, what I may call like an interview your heroes type exercise, which is regularly interview people who have sustained excellence. You might have an understanding of why I love doing this podcast. That's how I do it for myself, but others can do it as well. It doesn't have to be recorded. That process can then, you can be documenting what looks good, what doesn't, as well as ask, regularly asking questions from those who have come before you, I think is helpful. Yeah, great advice. Yeah. I want to go, um, let's go to John Perry, who John is a high school football coach. We've uh, communicated via Twitter a little bit, and I'm excited, John. I have unmuted you. I believe you're on video. Uh, ask away. Admiral, I want to uh, thank you for doing what you're doing, man. Absolutely awesome, giving us a chance to listen and learn. Ryan stole my first question, the behavior traits of some of the most successful people that you've been around, which you've answered. My second question is this. From a leadership standpoint, could you, could you give us two or three of your favorite books that you've ever read or made the most impact on you? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the books that, uh, that I really like, two of them, one is called The Speed of Trust, The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey. And uh, it's a business book, but the leadership uh, implications of it are pretty strong. And it is about how do you build trust? Uh, and you know, the, the, the point that, that Covey makes in this book is that it takes two things to build trust. One, you have to have a personal relationship. You've got to develop a relationship with a person. But number two, you have to deliver on your promises. So, you know, you can have a brother-in-law and you say, hey, I really trust my brother-in-law. He's a good guy. But if every time you get involved in a business venture with him, he doesn't come through, then you no longer trust him. So you build trust based on a personal relationship and the ability of somebody to deliver on their promises, whatever those happen to be. So I, I think the, the overall book is, is really good. The other one I would offer uh, is called It's Your Ship. It's Your Ship. Um, and it's written by a Navy uh, uh, captain about how he, can, he, he was uh, one of the best leaders in the Navy. Um, and Michael, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher his last name, uh, Brasmov, I think. Uh, and um, and it is uh, it's just a fabulous book. In fact, uh, I liked it so much that I, I gave copies to all of my staff at the University of Texas and said, look, if you want to know how I think and what I think is important, read this book, because all the things that, uh, that the captain brings out in the book are the sort of, uh, you know, tools and traits and qualities that, that I like to think that I had as a leader. Thank you much. You bet. Very good. Uh, next up, let's go to Gary Blackard. Gary, I uh, unmuted you. You're ready to rock, man. Go for it. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, Admiral, first of all, again, thank you for your service. Absolutely phenomenal to, to be with you today. Uh, I, I want to go to the topic of preparation. I want to get back to that a little bit. Uh, I, I'm the CEO for uh, an addiction recovery organization. We have 266 locations around the United States. Because of the current pandemic, uh, in the future, there's prediction, and it's based on previous data, there's prediction that addiction and substance abuse disorders will rise over the next 18 to 24 months. And as a result of that, I am in the midst of a preparation activity, a strategy to prepare my organization um, to be ready uh, for, for this surge, if you would. How would you or how have you motivated your troops or how have you gotten your troops prepared for perhaps something they're not they know something is coming but they're not exactly aware of it how, what, what's the best motivation that you've done as a leader yeah you got to get them involved so um you know whenever we're looking at building a strategy so when i took over u.s special operations command uh in my mind i had a vision of where i wanted to go um, but what I ended up doing was I took 
a number of the thought leaders from across the command, some of the junior enlisted guys, some of the more senior guys, and everybody in between. And I brought them into the room and I said, okay, look, here's what I think we need to do, or here's what we need to be prepared for. I want you guys to come together and build a strategy for me. Now, uh, one, that gives them buy-in at all levels of your chain of command, so to speak, because you know the young private uh, or the young petty officer had an opportunity to be part of the grand plan. Um, and so once you get that plan, of course, then you're in a position to say, hey, this is great. I'll take parts of this and parts of this. And you can, of course, use your vision to help craft that plan. But by giving them some ownership of the plan, let me tell you, when you roll it out, whatever it happens to be, then you're going to find universal buy-in. They will be a little bit of your, you know, your disciples on the ground saying, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. This is where we think addiction is going to be in five years, 10 years. This is how we're going to scale it, have to scale up the company in order to address it. And oh, by the way, I had a role in kind of looking at that. It wasn't just the CEO. It was us in the organization being part of it. That's great. Love it. Uh, I want to do one more. Uh, this is uh, Ed Arnston. He is uh, currently serving, and we've had great communication uh, for some time now. Ed, uh, I didn't give him a heads up. I was going to ask him to, to ask a question, but given that he is currently serving our country, uh, there you are in uniform. I'd love for, uh, for you to fire away and ask a question of, uh, for, for Admiral McRaven. Sir, uh, good morning. Um, my question is about, um, you know, perhaps the greatest leadership challenge that you faced uh, when you were a commander uh, or a captain, you know, 05, 06. And it could have been uh, when, you were, uh, when you were relieved, sir. And just to talk a little bit about how you got through that, because that's, uh, that's not an easy, you know, one week, one month process. If you could just talk a little bit about that, sir, uh, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, Ed, you, you know, at the end of the day, you got to have a battle buddy. You know the deal. Uh, you know, when, when you get, you know, kicked in the groin and, uh, and you, you're doubled over from pain for whatever the issue happens to be, you really do need somebody by your side. Uh, you know, and, and Ryan mentioned early on, Sergeant Major Chris Ferris, he was my command sergeant major, uh, both in my time at JSOC and then at SOCOM. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times that, you know, the sergeant major kind of pulled me aside in the office and said, Hey boss, it's going to be okay. Uh, you know, or, you know, it's time for you to buck up. You know, we, we need you to kind of be the leader that we need, you know, so having a battle buddy like that when, you know, cause all leaders, as you know, you know, every once in a while we all stumble, uh, we all have our weak moments. And so, you know, if you're at home, that's great. And your spouse can help you or, you know, somebody can help you through those tough times. But when you're deployed, as you well know, um, you better have a friend. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, the, the sergeant major, but it can be, you know, a fellow officer or somebody that you trust uh, that, can, that can help you through those rough moments. Um, and, you know, in the course of my career, there were probably two or three times, you know, I thought about, uh, you know, calling it a day. And each time, you know, I, uh, my wife said kind of the same thing. Hey, uh, yeah, you've never quit. Don't, don't start now. Uh, when I was a one star, I almost decided that, uh, you know, it was, it was time to, uh, you know, to, to retire. Uh, I was having a bad day in Afghanistan. Things weren't going well. You know, we'd lost some troops in combat. It was just, you know, the, the, the pressure of it. And you just thought, man, you know, how long can I continue this? And, um, and she brought me back from the ledge. So you have to have that. And I don't care how good a leader you are. I don't care how tough you are. You know, as you well know, Ed, you know, when you get in front of the troops, I tell folks as a leader, you can't have a bad day. You are not allowed to get up in front of the troops as a leader and show weakness, you know, whine about something, uh, look forlorn. That's not what the leaders need. Or that's not what the troops need in a leader. They need you to walk into the room with your head held high, knowing that you've got a plan, that you're calm under fire, uh, that you're going to be courageous when you need to be courageous. That's what they need. And that's what you have to be. But none of us are that way all the time. And so when you go back to your bee hut or you go back to wherever you're going to go every once in a while, you know, uh, you, you, and you're having a rough day, you better have somebody you can call on to give you a hand. 
I, I want to end with one that great ed thank you so much and thank you for your service as well yeah thanks ed appreciate what you're doing and uh sure. i, I want to close with one one uh question or one comment about a particular character or a person you know that you've written about um because there are going to be moments when all of us are what you deem sugar cookies and you can describe what being a sugar cookie is. I've never uh, actually been that exact thing, but I've, I've had moments where obviously I've messed up or uh, been down. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that you talk about though is, is, is don't ever blame others or say that's not fair or life's not fair. Um, it's, it's all about how we choose to respond. And the story that you've written about is, I, I, don't, I may be mispronouncing his name, is it Moki Martin? Um, and, and, and his, his outlook on life, uh, considering all the things that he has gone through, maybe you could close with the story of him and, and why we all as leaders should never have that life's not fair outlook. Yeah. Thanks, man. A great way to end it. So when you go through SEAL training, uh, you know, the instructors are king and whatever they say you got to do. And if they don't like you, you know, if you're a, Lakers fan and they're a Celtics fan, if you went to Texas and they went to OU, you know, no matter what it is, if they don't like you, they can just tell you to kind of hit it. You run fully clothed over the sand dunes, you jump in the Pacific Ocean, you come back, you roll around in the sand, you throw sh sand down your shorts, down your shirt, you are completely covered in sand and, uh, and the effect is called a sugar cookie. Well, one of the instructors that used to <laughs> harass me unmercifully was a, a Navy Lieutenant named Moki Martin. And Moki Martin was a, a, a former enlisted I had become a warrant officer and then what we call a limited duty officer. Uh, a, just a remarkable SEAL, Vietnam vet, uh, highly decorated in Vietnam, just incredibly capable, very professional. He could do everything well. But every time Moki would see me in SEAL training, he'd point me out and yell, Mr. Mack, hit it. You know, gosh, I'm not hit. So uh, when training was over, interestingly enough, he and I end up in the same team. And we became very good friends. And then in the early 80s, 1980, 81, uh, he was out um, riding his bicycle. He was a hell of an athlete, and he was pre prepping for a triathlon. And this was the beginning of the triathlon craze. And he's riding his bike in Coronado, going from uh, Coronado down to Imperial Beach. And he has a head-on bicycle accident. Runs head-on to a guy, another guy on a bicycle. And the other guy gets up, kind of dusts himself off. He's a little achy. And Moki was paralyzed from the chest down and has been for the last 37 years. And never once in those 37 years have I ever heard Moki Martin say, why me? You know, never once has he said, you know, gee, life's not fair. Because the lesson of the sugar cookie going through SEAL training was just that. It was a recognition that life's not fair. There were some guys who went through training and thought that if they finished first on the run, somebody ought to pat them on the back and tell them how great they were. If they finished first on the swim, somebody was going to applaud their efforts. And when that didn't happen, they didn't understand. But that was the lesson. Hey, life's not fair, get over it. And Moki Martin to this day, uh, you know, he, he never whined once, never said why me. He went on to be an accomplished painter, uh, fathered a child. And today uh, he supervises the UDT SEAL triathlon that they, they do every year in Coronado. Uh, I saw him about uh, six, eight months ago. He's as effervescent and as charismatic and as fired up as ever. Uh, and it is just a wonderful story. Wow. Thank you so much. What a perfect way to close. This has been just incredible. What an hour. Uh, and thank you all for being here, both people listening to the recording of this, as well as here live from all over the world. It's, I, I love this connection and the community we can build to try to, to get better together for an hour. It's just fantastic. And Admiral McRaven, you're the, the reason that it happened. So thank you so much for being My here. Program. Where would you send our viewers and listeners to learn more about you online? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Go to uh, Amazon and just search McRaven and, and buy. I, I'd say go to, you really don't actually. I, I, when I was doing research, you have very little online presence, but go to Amazon, no search. No Facebook, no Twitter, no, yeah. you know. Yeah, I would I, honestly I encourage you to, to, to get the books. Um, there's multiple books, but get them and read them. They're very uh, well done, as you can imagine, by how well spoken Admiral McRaven is. But once again, thank you so much for your service uh, to our country. For those of us who are Americans, um, I'm indebted to you and, and thank you uh, for all the work that you've done, and then and for investing your time with uh, with us here today. This was just a fantastic. I was happy to do it, man. Thanks very much. Love, 
love to continue our dialogue as we both progress, man. You bet. Y'all take care out there. All right. Thank you. See you, everyone. Right.